The following exposition is by a Puritan named Thomas Taylor. The Seed That Fell Among the Thorns. This book came out about the year 1632. Mark 4 verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. That which our Savior taught his disciples, namely, what an hard thing it is to be saved, we have evidently seen in the explanation of the former ground, in which we have discovered a number of hearers who have gone so far in the way of heaven, as most of our hearers come not near them, to be but reprobate ground and lose all their labor and expectation. But yet we shall more clearly discern that truth and have more occasion seriously to consider of it, when we shall in this last ground, the best of all the bad ones, make manifest that they that step before and beyond the former shall yet fall short of their aim and be shut out of heaven as well as they. For there was nothing good in the former which is wanting in this, but some further commendation in this which was not in the former. First, the kind of soil, some of the seed fell among thorns. Number two, the success of the seed in it. Commendable and lamentable. Number three, the reasons or causes of failing. For the soil it is thorny ground. For the commendable success, it goes as far as the former in hearing, verse 14. In receiving Matthew thirteen twenty, and Mark four fourteen, and in growing as our text has it, it goes far beyond it. For first the ground is softer, the mold moister, the soil deeper, and so more hope. Secondly, it springs beyond the other; the other grows, but this sprang up, not only to a blade but to an ear though not a ripe one. Neither does a stone hinder the rooting while they are hearing, but after they are departed, thorns choke it. Thirdly, they hold on their profession still, which the other loses. They are not driven off by persecution, but would obey still, did it not cross their pleasures and profits. For the lamentable success it is set down, verse 14, they bring forth no fruit, that is either no good crop or no lasting fruit to the harvest. They bring no fruit to the end or to maturity, for fruit they bring, though not to perfection. The causes of this failing are set down, first, in general, to be thorns, namely inward lusts, carnal affections, and corrupt desires. Number two, and special of three sorts, number one, cares of the world, verse 14, and Matthew 13, verse 22. Number two, riches, verse 14, called the deceitfulness of riches, Matthew 13, 22. Number three, voluptuous living, verse 14, called by the other evangelists, Lusts of other things, these enter and choke the word, Mark 4, verse 19. So in one view, you have the sum and method of the text, enlarged out of the other evangelists. Now for the exposition of the first, consider number one, why lusts are compared to thorns. Number two, why these hearers are compared to thorny ground. Carnal lusts are fitly compared to thorns in five respects. Number one, there are some flowers and some show on the thorns, small fruits and many pricks. So whatever appearance these lusts make, no good fruit rises of them, but many pricks and sorrows by them in the end. Thorns pierce the body. The lusts the mind. Number two. Thorns are everywhere armed and ready to wound and tear him that meddling with him does not carefully fence himself. So they that nourish the cares of the world or addict themselves to pleasure or profits 
pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Number three, is a thorn held softly pricks not, nor does it hurt, but when it is held hard and crushed, it easily draws blood. So a man may use this world as not using it without danger, and hold softly the profits and pleasures of this life, but gripe them and fasten on them, there is a certain hurt. Number four. Thorns and briars are the dens and receptacles of serpents, and poisonful worms and creatures. So are these unmortified desires the harbors of infinite noisome sins, which shall creep as thick into the soul as the frogs into Pharaoh's lodgings. As Israel was not content with God's daily allowance, but out of a covetous and distrustful desire against God's commandment, save some of the manna till morning, but it was all full of worms and stunk, so do fleshly minds by nourishing unlawful lusts turn manna into worms. If thorns and briars are at last good for nothing but fuel for the fire, so these thickets of lusts and pursuit after the profits and pleasures of this life are the proper fuel of the fire of the great day and prepare the ground itself, which all worldlings are, without timely repentance, as fuel for the fire of hell, which is unquenchable. These bad hearers are as aptly compared to thorny ground, for as a thorny and weedy soil chokes and kills at length such seeds as come up hopefully, so in heart stuffed with unmortified affections at length resists and chokes the seed of God's word, that it shall not prosper to the salvation of that hearer in the harvest for first, the thorns supplant the word and unroot it again, as thorns to root themselves undermine the seed below. Number two, these thorny corruptions hinder the comfortable heat and shine of the sun from the heart, namely the sweet beams and influence of the spirit of grace, which cannot come so sweetly and freely to the heart to cherish the growth and work begun if thorns hinder the sun from plants. Number three, thorns draw away the moisture which should preserve the plants in their growth and greenness. Even so, these inward lusts draw the heart from means of moisture of grace. They sometimes give a man leave to hear, but as they prevail and take up the heart, there shall be little time allowed to remember, meditate, or apply that which is heard, and is small leave to bring things into practice. Doctrine In that our Savior compares bad hearers to thorny ground, we learn that thorns and lusts of any sort, allowed to grow in the heart, soon overgrows the word of God and allows it not to prosper. For as a husbandman that allows thorns and weeds to choke his seed coming up loses his harvest, even so that man loses his part in the gospel that cherishes lusts and disordered desires in his heart together with the gospel. Hence the Apostle James in chapter 121 tells us that if we would hear the word so as it may be engrafted in us, we must first cast away or put off as an old rag the superfluity of maliciousness and filthiness, that is the abundance of carnal affections, looseness of life, pride, disdain, wrath, contention, earthly pleasures, vanity, evil speaking of divine doctrine, and so on. And in the next verse shows that with these lusts men may be hearers of the word but never doers, Till they be weeded out, they will at length overgrow it. See this in the examples of wicked men. Herod let his lust and inordinate affection to his brother's wife grow with the word. Therefore, notwithstanding, he reverenced John and did many things gladly, 
Yet this lust choked the word, and it came to nothing. Judas heard the word from the mouth of Jesus Christ, and by it grew to a great reformation. But allowing the lust of covetousness to grow up with it, it soon overgrew the word, and he betrayed his master. Simon Magus heard the word, believed, walked with Philip as a disciple. No gross thing appeared in him. A man would have thought the word wondrously powerful in him, but he allowed the lust of pride or covetousness to spring up with the word, and when occasion was offered, it overtopped the word and betrayed itself in seeking to buy the gifts of the Holy Ghost with money. See it also in the examples of good men, Romans 7, 19, 20, and 21. Paul professes of himself that he cannot do the good he would because evil is present with him. And generally of all believers, Galatians 5, 17, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Asa, a good king, being reproved by Hanani, the seer, for his vain confidence in the king of Syria was wroth with him and put him in a prison house. For the text says he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And so was Jonah with the Lord himself. What are the reasons for this? Number one, eel weeds, we say, spring apace. Good seed are herbs, not half so fast. We shall see a bramble grow more in seven months than an oak in seven years. So in our text, the thorns grow up with the seed, but choke it by overgrowing. Number two, our grounds are fit and prepared to produce thorns rather than bring up the good seed. Our hearts are the natural mother to lusts, but a stepmother to seeds of grace. For there lies in our nature a sea of evil lusts lurking. Our own original lust is a fountain and an inordinate disposition to all evil, from which fountain issues innumerable streams of actual lusts, which are the innumerable motions of the soul contrary to every commandment of God, all which in their several armies and bands issue out against God and his word as the Philistines still warred against Israel. Now our ground being so apt to weeds, they will soon overgrow the word if but a little neglected. Number three. A part of the curse on man's sin is that the earth should bring forth thorns and thistles. The earth should have brought them forth if man had not sinned, but they should not have been so noisome and hurtful to man and the fruits of the earth. Even so, it is a part of the curse of our sin that there should grow up such noisome lusts as thorns in the grounds of our hearts, as do far more hinder the growth of grace in our hearts and choke the seed of the word sown in our souls than all the weeds and thorns in the world can choke the seeds and fruits of the earth. Lusts are still remaining in the best of us, but not now as a curse, but only as the Canaanites to keep us humble. Number four. The reign of lust cannot but thrust down the reign of the word, for first, that the word may reign, it must be understood. But thorns hinder the light of the sun from the seed. How can a man see objects that has a thorn run into his eye? So one thorn is enough to darken the eye of the understanding, and therefore 1 Peter 2 verse 1. The apostle wishes us to lay aside all evil affections, not some, not a little, not the waste bows, but the root and stump. Secondly, that the word may reign, it must first renew, but there can be no creature till the old man is put off with his lusts. Ephesians 4, 22 and 23. Till this be, the truth of Christ cannot be learned as in Christ. Impossible it is to answer the heavenly seed, or be answerable to the means of divine regeneration unless we put away the former pravity of nature, as a man can never set up a new frame till he have removed the old rubbish. Thirdly, 
that the word may reign, it must be obeyed when it commands and be expressed in the fruits of holiness. But lusts, unsubdued, oppose themselves and hinder the motions when they should come into practice. And the Lord's plant becomes fruitful only on that condition that the Father purge it. John 15 verse 2. How can a man walk on cheerfully in his way that hath a thorn sticking in his foot? No less do these thorns cast men back in their way of obedience. These superfluities of lusts and inordinate desires are as dead branches that must be lopped off before fruit can be expected. Application number one. By this see the reason why numbers have either grown so slowly or not at all after much labor of the Lord's husbandmen, namely because their hearts are as thorny ground. Some come with their minds stuffed with covetous desires. Some with fleshly imaginations or filthy cogitations. Others with proud conceits of their own knowledge and wisdom. Others alienated with contempt and hatred of the word which crosses their lusts. Partial hearers hear with respect of persons or degrees. Popish hearers never profit, they come with obstinacy and prejudice of our doctrine. Where these are the like lusts sway, expect no profit. No planting, no watering can make seed prosper where the thorns grow with it. Objection. One lust can do no great harm. In other things we are honest enough, but only in usury or gaming or a little oath or a lie now and then. Answer. One thief is enough to betray in house. One devil allowed to enter bring seven worse than himself. And let any come with purpose to continue in any one sin. Nothing shall move him. Nothing shall convert him. One swine spoils a whole garden. One dead fly the whole ointment. One hole in a ship the whole vessel. Application number two. If we desire the word should prosper in us, do as a good husbandman, who would keep his ground in good kilter, on which his seed is cast, or to be cast, first he will bring in the plow to prepare it, and lay it fallow both to rot and unroot the weeds that would choke the seed. For it is a shame and part of negligence in an husbandman to have his fallows lie full of weeds. So must you see that you bring into your heart the grace of mortification, which is a general unrooting of the thorns and weeds. Good husbandry contents not itself with some good seed springing up unless it kill the weeds. No more content you yourself with the rising and moving of some good affections unless you mortify the bad and noisome ones. Jeremiah 4 verse 4, plow up the fallow ground of your hearts and sow not among the thorns. Secondly, the husbandman plows it again, that if any weeds peep out, he may root them up. So careful he is for his earthly commodity. No less careful should we be if after grace receive lusts will be still stirring to root them out. Hebrews 12:15 Take heed that no root of bitterness bring up and trouble you. According to that in Deuteronomy 29:18 Let there be no root among you that brings gall and wormwood. If there be any lust, be it never so secret and hidden as a root, or never so fixed and fastened as a root is, spare it not, nip it not off, but pluck it up by the roots. Be not content to bridle lusts, but kill them. Don't satisfy yourself with an absence of fleshly operation, as if it were sanctification, but only with a slaying of it. For if there be a living root within, it will show itself when the seed springs, and soon overtake it too. Thirdly, if after all this there are weeds growing up with the seed, the husbandman will bring in his weeding hook into the field. He will not see a weed or thorn peep, but he will weed it out. First, because he would have his corn grow alone. Would you have the word to thrive in your soul? 
let it grow alone. How speedily should a man rise towards heaven if the word had the only room in his heart. But secondly, because that it is impossible either in the earth or our hearts, he will be sure by his hook to set the seed above the weeds. Labor thou also to set the word above your lusts and contrary motions. Question, but how shall I do that? Answer number one. By daily exercise in the word, reading and meditating, this discovers the weeds and thorns. Number two. By daily prayer and confession of known sins, this is the getting of the weeding hook into our hands. Number three, by Christian humility and fasting, that is the cutting off of lust by which the daily wither and dry away this crucifies the affections and lusts. Number four, by avoiding occasions of sin and sinners, especially watching narrowly our own inclinations. Number five, keep under the lusts of the flesh by the lusts of the spirit, Galatians 5.17. The spirit lusts against the flesh, that is both in curbing and restraining evil motions and engendering good cogitations, motions, and desires agreeable to the will of God, Romans 13. By putting on the Lord Jesus, repress the lusts of the flesh. Proverbs 12.5, a godly man is said to have right thoughts. Proverbs 11.23, his desires are only good, not that he is without evil desires sometime, but he resists and fights against them, and God imputes not that which he hates and repents of. We see the soil, now let us see the hopeful success of the seed in it. The thorns grow with it. Though there be a further growth of the seed in this ground than in the former, yet at length it is as fruitless. Number one, here are soft and tender hearts brought to the word, better prepared for the seed than the former. Number two, here is a deeper rooting, a further measure of understanding, a more vehement carriage of the affection unto it, in motions of joy, love, and delight, and a more settled purpose to follow the word. Number three, here is a further show of fruit, a standing in a glorious profession, and hopeful sprouting and springing in the fruits of good works, and a longer hope by this than before. Yet these so softened, so rooted, so far grown above many zealous professors are still numbered in the rank of bad and fruitless hearers, for as it is in verse 14, afterward they are choked. Doctrine. The fruitful and commendable hearer is he that hears for afterward. A bad hearer can hear well for the present, but afterward all is lost. Proverbs 4.18 The way of the righteous shines as light, that shines more and more until the perfect day. They add unto their knowledge as men do to their stock, and save what they get, and so grow abundantly rich in grace. Whereas he that spends as fast as he gets and only maintains a present, with his getting must die a beggar. Many are the exhortations to lay fast hold on the word, and so lay it up safe in the midst of the heart, and to keep it as a man's life, Proverbs 4.4. 4. As a man that hath a jewel, will be careful to lock it up in the safest chest he has, First Timothy 3.9. Keep the mysteries of faith. Revelation 3.11, hold that thou hast, hold that thou hearest. As many are the dehortations that we negligently lose not the word. Hebrews 2.1, we ought diligently to give heed to the things we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. A metaphor taken from ribbon vessels, let, let all the liquor run out. But here, the more precious the liquor is, the more must be the care of the vessel and its soundness. 2 Peter 2, 21. Better not to have known the way of truth than after the knowledge to depart from the holy commandment. Many are the commendations of them that were hearers for after times, as of David, Psalm 119, 11. I have hid thy word in my heart. And of Mary, who pondered Christ's sayings, 
and hid them in her heart, Luke 2, 51. And as many are the dispraisers of such leaking vessels, who like the woman in 2 Timothy 3, 7, are always learning, yet never come to the knowledge of the truth, and those Jews in Hebrews 5.12 who for the time might have been teachers yet needed to be catechized in the very first principles. Reason 1. From the nature of the word, which is in itself a perpetual truth, an everlasting gospel, heaven and earth are most stable and firmly sounded by God, but not so stable as the least jot of God's word, which shall not fail or fall to the ground forever. And to us it is a certain rule, a constant law and binder, not for the present only, but for all time, future, yea, and for all eternity. Number two, this is the main difference between a godly man and an hypocrite. Many things may affect an evil man for the present hearing of the word, Sometimes he may hear a novelty with great affection, but his children delight in a new toy for an hour, but presently contemn and lose it. Sometimes the power of the word makes an hypocrite tremble as Felix, and grow to some promise with himself, and perhaps to some purpose and resolution of amendment. So Israel, hearing the Lord speak in so terrible a voice, promises fair, all that the Lord our God saith by thee, if he will no more speak by himself, we will hear it and do it. But the Lord saw there was no such heart in them. Deuteronomy 5, 27 and 29. Sometimes some affliction prepares them to hear. And now while the iron is in the fire and the hammer upon it, it may be wrought to some fashion till it be cold again. So Pharaoh sometime will confess his sin and acknowledge God's righteousness and beg prayers of Moses, but only so long as the plague is upon him. Sometimes some natural motion or some spiritual motion may stir them, and for a flash they are earnestly resolved for heaven. So the young man comes hastily and hears gladly, but not purposing to do all that is required goes away heavily. The hypocrite in all these motions is like Ephraim, whose goodness was as a morning dew suddenly dried up. Hosea 6, four. The word comes into a bottomless heart, wherein is a bottomless gulf of guile and deceit, and all is lost at length. But the godly man, by the words dwelling plentifully in his heart, attains the commendation pronounced upon the church of Thyatira, Revelation 2.19, I know thy works, thy faith, and so on, that they be more at last than at first. He has on him a mark of one that is planted by the Lord in the house of the Lord. He is more fruitful in his age, more fat and fresh daily, and exceeds his former times in ferocity and fruitfulness and good works and graces. In a word, whereas all other things are common to all, the heavens, the earth, the creatures, yea, the ministry of the word, sacraments, prayer, and many common graces wrought by them. This alone is a special right of believers, incommunicable with hypocrites, to have the word of God everlastingly fixed in their hearts. Isaiah 8.16 Seal up the law among my disciples. Now a seal is a means of secrecy from them whom the manner concerns not, and of assurance to them whom the business concerns. This is the second reason. Number three, the best of God's word is after the hearing. Our parable compares hearing of the word to sowing. Now the best of sowing is long after in the reaping. Elsewhere it is compared to food. And the best of eating is after eating in the nourishment and strength. For let men eat and drink with great appetite, good taste, and much pleasure. Yet if after the eating bad humors in the stomach allow it not to stay or not to digest if it does stay, it does much hurt instead of nourishing. So in the state of the soul where many wicked humors resist the work of the word heard. But to show in special that the word is best after the hearing, consider number one, that it frames a man to the life of faith and upholds that life. It is a means to make a man good and continue his goodness. 
because it both stores a man with graces and preserves him from ungracious courses through all his life, which those that make no use of the word beyond the hearing are wrapped in. Proverbs 2 verse 10. When wisdom enters into the heart, then shall counsel preserve you, and understanding shall keep you. That is both in the good way and from the evil way. So Psalm 119 verse 11. I have hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word kept in the heart makes a man a notable pattern of piety to others, and a fruitful Christian upholding him in a readiness to every good word and work. If the heart keep knowledge, the mouth will speak of wisdom, Psalm 49.3. He is fit and ready to counsel, exhort, rebuke, and comfort others. For the word of God, which is able to make the man of God ready and absolute to every good work, is much more able to fit private Christians thereunto. Number three, our greatest business is behind, to which the word kept in the soul can only fit us, as namely to fit our accounts, to store our lamps with oil, to hold on our repentance and finish the good work begun with perseverance. Number four, our greatest sufferings and trials are behind, days of sickness, the day of temptation, the day of death, in which Satan will be most furious and raging, in the day of judgment. Now as David said of himself, if thy word had not been my comfort, I had perished in my trouble. So if the word be not thy sword in the day of temptation, if it is not your health in sickness, your life in death, if it plead not for you in judgment, you are everlastingly lost, because you have willfully lost your part and portion of that blessed word. Number five, our mark is still before us, even that everlasting happiness and great salvation which the word of God faithfully retained in the heart not only reveals but puts us in possession of. Thus as a pillar of the cloud and of the fire never left Israel till they came into Canaan, no more does the word of God cease to be our constant direction for our motion or station till it has set us into that heavenly Canaan. No nor then it be in a surer pillar than that of the cloud. For as the prophet says, O Lord, thy word endures forever in heaven, Psalm 119.89. That is, although never so many things on earth seem to cloud and cross the gracious promises that you have made to your children, yet in heaven shall they taste the sweetness of your word more than ever they did in earth, when they shall enjoy all the fruits of that eternal love and decree which they believed in this world. Besides that, the same word of God, which now the saints lay up in their hearts, is the law and charter of heaven, by which, being fully conformed to the obedience of it, we shall walk eternally before God in the perfection of that obedience which is here begun. And thus it is our eternal direction in heaven also. Use 1. To reprove many hearers who are affected in the act and time of hearing, or while the doctrine is delivered, but presently lose the manner, the motion, and the affection in all. Some come as our Savior's hearers, Matthew twenty two twenty two. When they heard, they marveled, and left him and went their way. We hear no more of them. Many hear desirously as with open and erect ears, but both being open, it goes in at one and out at the other. It stays not for after use, but a little present admiration, as in those hearers of our Savior. Others hear, and the word smites them works a little on their conscience, wounds them, and tells them, as Nathan did David, Thou art a man. Now we're a fit season to work with God, but they go away, other distractions meet them at home. The motion dies, and they are as men seasick, while the word tumbles them, and makes their conscience womble within them, but are all well again, so soon as ever they come to land. Others here with soft hearts, and the word coming home, they begin to melt, can resolve into tears. So mellow seems the ground. They see their unworthiness of the promises, and how liable they are to all the threatenings, which they conceive are their own portion. But as the metals are only soft and pliable while they are in the fire, so these in the hearing but shortly after lose all the efficacy of the word and become hardened as before. 
Others stirred up by the power of the word to some good duty formerly neglected now grow to some resolution that no lying in the way shall hinder them. And purpose, a man would think in themselves do so, unfeignedly a great change in themselves, but shortly after proved like the son in the parable, Matthew twenty one thirty, whom his father commanded to go work in the vineyard. He promised he would, and likely he purposed he would, but some other motion prevailing, he went not. So we have many hearers, many times in good moods, but corruption of nature not subdued, not mastered, which is not always stirring alike, watches the fittest time to resist a word, so his present purposes are seldom or never followed to practice in future performances. Application 2. Look well to your hearing, for at times that with knowledge you may join obedience, and by the word grow in grace as you do in days. Content not yourself to hear with a soft heart or with a joyful heart, if it be hollow, and allow it not to slip. Consider for motives hereunto, number one, that as God has made our blood a carrier and conveyor of life through all the body, so is word to carry the spirit and life through all the soul. And less dangerous it is to break a vein, to let out all the blood and life of the body, than to admit a cliffed in our souls that the doctrine of life and salvation should run out. Number two, the world casts nothing upon him that is a waster and spendthrift, nor can he be ruler of much that is not a faithful keeper and saver of little. If you save not what you hear, nor lay it up, you shall never be a rich man in knowledge, faith, comfort, or experience. Nature teaches to save somewhat against a rainy day, Consider what days you have to pass, if prosperous, if adverse, if sick, if sound, if temptations on the right hand or left, if life or death, if whatsoever, you are naked without the word, without strength, counsel, comfort. Number four, a godly man will be a Christian at home as well as in the church, and as David walk uprightly in the midst of his house means to do this afterward. Be abundantly covetous to lay up a good store for yourself against the time to come. Enlarge your affections insatiably to gather all you may. This is a gracious and commendable covetousness. Esteem it above all keeping, more worth than much fine gold. Psalm 119, 127. Account it your heritage and the joy of your heart. Let it be in your heart first, treasure it there. A man reserves his barn or his crop of wheat or other corn. Will you fill your barn and garner with chaff and stubble? Or will you, instead of gold or pearls, pester your best coffer with dross and pebbles, which are heavy and cumbersome, but of no price or value? Number four, bind the truth on your fingers. Proverbs 7, 3 is a ring that is ever in sight. Practice is the best keeper of the word. The thorn sprang up and choked it. Now we are to entreat of the felling of the seed in this ground, wherein, because there is but little difference from the withering we spake of in the former grounds, but that it proceeds from other causes, we will therefore inquire into those causes, as they are particularly and in order set down in the 14th verse, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of this life, these are described as the special thorns which choke the seed of the word. So note in general what it is that lets us from heaven, not only the pursuit of unlawful things, but the abuse of lawful. It is not whoredom, adultery, theft, murder, Sabbath breaking, and the like that here are said to choke the seed and hinder our harvest, but the abuse of lawful profits, pleasures, cares, and desires. Matthew twenty four thirty eight. As in the eyes of Noah they did eat and drink and marry and gave themselves in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. What? Was it a sin to eat, to drink, to marry? Were these the things for which they were destroyed? No, but the abuse of these things. They were so holy in these as they securely cast off all admonitions and all prediction of danger 
these became thorns and choked all counsel and all the preaching of Noah. And so their destruction was sudden, not because it was not foretold, but it was not believed or regarded. Luke 14, 16, what was more lawful than to buy a farm and a yoke of oxen or to marry a wife? But yet thee shall never taste of the supper, not because they did these things, but because they were so inordinate and intent on them that they refused a call to the king's supper. And these three sorts of invited guests refusing the king's gracious invitation do notably resemble and express these three sorts of thorns choking the word. The farm indicates riches, oxen, the cares of this life, and the wife, voluptuous living, all which or any of them hinder men from the heavenly banquet. So 1 Corinthians 10, 7, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Reason number one, sins and lawful things are both more ordinary and less sensible, both for the avoiding and preventing is also for the recovery and repentance from them. What a number of natural and indifferent actions does every man go over every day, into which creep a number of sins, because men take themselves free to do as they list in them, and only content themselves in their liberty unto the thing, unwilling to hear of any of God's restraints or impositions in the manner or fruition of that liberty. This point is very useful, and therefore we will give some instances to show how men do instantly abuse their lawful liberties with the great hazard of their souls. Number one, in eating and drinking, which is not only lawful but necessary, yet here Christians often exceedingly many ways, number one, when they eat not their own bread, 2 Thessalonians 3.12, number two, when they eat without fear, Jude 12, not before the Lord. Number three, when they corrupt themselves and the creatures, losing sobriety, modesty, chastity, health, and reason, as the drunkard drowns his soul, senses, body, and all. Number four, when they never taste the sweetness of God and the creatures more than beasts, nor sanctify themselves after feasting as Job his sons. Number five, when they waste the creatures, not remembering the afflictions of Joseph, Amos 6.6. 6. Number two, what is more necessary than apparel decently to cover nakedness, to fence the body from injury of weather, and to put us in mind of sin? But what a number of sins do men and women put on with their apparel? For the manner which is not skins as atoms, but stately and costly. Number two, for the manner, while they take liberty to disguise themselves in strange attire in monstrous fashions, showing no other hidden man of the heart, but lightness, vanity, wantonness, and slavishness to every new-fangled fashion for which the Lord threatened to visit the king's children. Zephaniah 1, verse 8. Number three, for the measure, while they pass all bounds of sobriety and waste more on their backs most prodigally than would clothe a number of the poor servants of Jesus Christ. And all out of this conceit, that they may wear what they list and how they list, not considering that the Lord has tied them as straightly to the rules of piety, sobriety, and charity in the wearing, as to the necessity of wearing itself, besides the waste of time and thoughts and so on, which should be better occupied. Thirdly, what is more lawful, yea, more necessary than recreation? But how do men out of the lawful liberty that God has allowed them break out most unlawfully and most insensibly? First, in respect of the matter, when with the fool, Proverbs 26, 18, they make a pastime of sin, as of dice, condemned by the laws of the land, and cards, and lascivious dancing, plays, interludes, and all merriments, wherein is no praise, virtue, or good report. Number two, in respect of the manner, when they turn their vocation into a recreation, when they power out their hearts unto pleasure, as lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, when they waste their time and engross it for sports, to the hindrance of better duties in the public and private calling, when the public or private duties of God's holy Sabbaths are interrupted or omitted, when to the dishonor of God is sacred name by others, and cursings is blasphemed, 
or his holy word jested upon, or his faithful servants, the preachers and professors of religion, are reviled and reproached by plays, songs, or scorns. Lastly, when other men are hurt by sports and games, as by winning of their money to their impoverishment and hindrance, or a man's own estate, as Solomon saith, he that loveth pastime shall be a poor man, both in grace and goods. Yet what gamester of a thousand sees himself tumbling in these sins? Or where is one of a thousand that will be reclaimed from them? The conclusion of Thomas Taylor's comments on the parable of the sower in the seed that fell into thorny ground will be in our next podcast, www.puritanaudiobooks.com.